Uh, welcome back to our webinar series about Kotlin for the server-side programming. And today we have a session about functional programming in Kotlin with Arrow KT. Uh, that is going to be brought to you by Simon and Alejandro from um, <clears throat> 37 Degrees. Uh, the, the folks are pumped and prepared. And uh, this is the session. Uh, which is a part of our three webinar series uh, uh, for like December edition. It's the fourth edition that we are doing. And uh, you can see the uh, previous sessions recorded on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Uh, we we announced next sessions uh, on, on these channels as well. So you can subscribe at, and set a reminder for yourself not to miss the sessions and join us live. Uh, so uh, let's get back to our uh, presentation and uh, let's welcome Simon and uh, Alejandro to the studio. Hello, folks. Hi, uh, everyone. Welcome, here. welcome, I'm really happy to have you. Uh, we are trying to expose more information about Kotlin libraries and Arrow is definitely a popular one. So I'm really happy to have you on this channel. And uh, without further ado, I, I would like you to, you know, to introduce yourself and uh, start the presentation. I think people are waiting eagerly for that. Great, thanks. Simon, you wanna start? Sure. Uh, so I'm Simon, uh, I'm from Belgium, Antwerp, and I've been a uh, software engineer for the last seven years. Uh, I started using Kotlin in 2015 uh, when I was working as an Android developer and I very quickly fell in love with the language. Uh, since the last several years, I've been also using Kotlin and tooling and in the backend. And the best known project that I'm working on is probably the open source project Arrow, uh, but I'm also here to talk about today. Thanks, uh, Ale. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Alejandro. I've been an engineer for like a decade or so. Actually, I've started doing Haskell, but uh, recently I moved to start working on on uh, Kotlin. Uh, working now uh, with the same company as Simon at forty seven degrees, and yeah, I'm I'm helping them uh, making the Arrow Arrow library, which has a lot of things uh, which come from from like a, a functional background and. And also, I'm working developing some Kotlin compiler plugins, which maybe if we have time, I'll show you. I'll show you at the end. Perfect. So uh, we already have a lot of folks commenting in the in the chat, and uh, I really encourage the crowd to actually ask the questions, uh, which we will handle at the end of the session, I guess. Or well, the way it flows, maybe folks want to take the questions in the middle as well. Uh, so heated discussions are welcomed in the chat. And with that, I'm, I'm going to stay in the background. I will be monitoring the chat, but I will disappear from the session so that only two of you are presenting. So uh, see you in a few minutes, right? Like in, in an hour. Yeah. See you Thank in a you bit. so much, Anton. Great. So uh, let me maybe maybe introduce a bit. You know, uh, both Simon and I have have talked about uh, the Arrow library, and well, even though it's it's gaining popularity, maybe it's it's good to introduce a bit the library. So so uh, well, uh, we, we like to think of Arrow uh, as a library that complements that that uh, fill the gaps of what it's missing in some other parts of the ecosystem. If you are if you are seeing uh, well the website, that's what I'm showing here. Uh, we talk a lot about a companion library for other different libraries. In fact, Arrow uh, is not itself one library. is is a, a set of libraries I have here. Well, the the main four that we develop. So core, which is uh, you know what is missing from from the standard library. We have FX, which is the same thing for the for the core routines uh, framework, and then we have some others like optics, which is uh, um, things which are missing to better manipulate once you start using immutable data everywhere. And, and you know what, what I'm actually working on is is Meta, which is a meta programming library, which means is uh, a library to 
to work over Kotlin code. So it somehow uh, enhances what the Kotlin uh, compiler API already give us. And we are actually uh, developing some, some cool new things uh, using this library. So, so using uh, this library, which is, uh, by the way, in, in many, in many, in many ways, it's it's inspired by by functional programming. But as, as, as I say, it's it's not itself that we want to bring everything which might be available in Haskell or a Scala. It's just that we want to bring what makes sense and it's idiomatic in Kotlin. What what we think that enhances the the, the code that we that we write and. And today is an example of how uh, you can use it. We've prepared a small, a small uh, web server example. It's just an 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 easy uh, cater base cater base uh, web server, which just has a couple of roots. And we are using there actually things uh, from from FX and from Core to to you know to show you how you can actually use these these ideas from the library to alleviate things which are usually more boilerplate or are not that uh, simple to to express without this library so uh, actually now now uh, Simon will take the word and will introduce the project and uh, the idea is that he will talk about circuit breaker which is something uh, quite cool you can do with the FX uh, library then I will talk about how you can actually do validation in a more powerful way using Arrow. And as I said at the beginning, if, if time allows, we would, we would love to show you a bit what we are doing in optics and meta, you know, so that you know what kind of things we're working on. So Simon, your turn. All right, uh, thank you. Um, so today we're going to look at the KTAR project, which is modeling an order service. So first, let's take a quick look at the domain uh, of our backend, of our microservice. Uh, and as you can see here, we have two data classes, an order, which has a list of entries. And an entry is defined by a product ID and an amount of which you want to uh, buy or order the specific product ID. And here we are using value classes to uh, model product IDs in a slightly nicer way. Uh, and some of you might have read some of my previous blogs, but this is very in line with domain-driven design. So we want uh, model that we use in our code to mimic as closely as possible the model that we have in reality. And also in that regard, we want to talk about the product ID and not a string. Uh, so in the entry, we can talk about a product ID type and not a string type. Uh, so in this domain-driven uh, design is something that you also might note from object-oriented programming. It's uh, it's something that is agnostic uh, from a uh, programming paradigm. And that's why I think this is also very interesting to briefly mention uh, in Kotlin that this line between OP and FP uh, can become very thin, as we will see today. Um, <clears throat> additionally, uh, Alejandro also already mentioned Ma uh, mentioned optics uh, so you, you can see here the optics annotation uh, since we are working with immutable data classes we, we can either use the copy method which we can find from kotlin out of the box or we can use optics uh, to work with immutable data in a more powerful way which we will show in the end if it still have some time or perhaps in another or in the next webinar so let's take a look at our actual logic and let's jump to the warehouse functionality. So uh, when we are working in our Cater code base, we are modeling uh, use cases or functionality in terms of interfaces. And the reason that we use interfaces is, for example, because the warehouse might be talking to a database or another remote API, or it could also be a test double. For example, in this case, the implementation of the warehouse is actually a testable, which makes it very easy to provide uh, stubs or test doubles for unit testing and doing things like test-driven development where you might want to test your logic before you're actually talking to the remote API. Uh, so again, this is a practice that is also very common in object-oriented programming. Uh, and it's a pattern that is also 
uh, used a lot in FP. Additionally, here we also mark the function with suspend. Uh, I mentioned before that this could be talking to the remote database uh, or another remote API. Uh, so marking it as suspend always gives us the power to model these things in the principal way. There is another very interesting thing here in this uh, file, which is the validate availability function. And instead of being a function inside of the interface, uh, it is actually an extension function on the interface. And that is a very interesting difference because if you implement the warehouse interface, you can now override the checkability functionality, but you can never override uh, or change the behavior of validate availability. And that is actually something here that we want because validate availability uh, composes the functionality of validation around the existing behavior in the interface. And we are actually never interested in somebody being able to change or stop this functionality. So by making it an extension function, we can guarantee that this logic is always the same and it's only depending on the implementation of check availability. So modeling functions in terms of member functions of an interface and extension functions on an interface have a very big uh, difference in your ar architectural plans. Uh, and it's very uh, interesting to consider the difference. So what is another useful thing that we can do with interfaces? Um, another very interesting thing that we can do with interfaces is composition. So interfaces compose, and here we can say we want to compose our interface billing with a data type circuit breaker. And as you can see here below, you can very easily uh, do that with uh, the decorator pattern. And that's again a pattern that many people might know from object-oriented programming. And here we are using this object-oriented programming technique to implement a, a functionality or a pattern that we care about in FP, which is composing the billing interface with a circuit breaker data type. So before we continue, uh, let's quickly recap uh, what a circuit breaker is uh, and why we need it. Uh, no. It's, uh, so here in the main function, you can see that we construct uh, a circuit breaker. Uh, and it's actually an important thing here because a circuit breaker is a stateful uh, object, which means that we need to pass it around and share the instance between, um, between different implementations. So what does a circuit breaker do? Uh, and you know, what's the point of using it? So a circuit breaker is used to wrap uh, functionality, as we can see here, we can use it to protect the processing billing API. And what it does is uh, it will detect failures. And depending on the failures that occur, it will uh, open the circuit breaker and not allow any traffic to come through. Sorry, it will not allow any traffic to go through. So when the circuit breaker opens, it will not allow our function to actually reach the billing API. And that is useful, for example, if the billing API, which is a very crucial uh, API in our uh, system of microservices, uh, if it gets too many requests and it gets overloaded, it's prone to going down and potentially resulting in a cascading failure of microservices, which is something that we absolutely don't want. So what can we do with the circuit breaker? We can say, okay, if you see two failures in a row, I want you to open the circuit breaker and not allow any traffic to flow to the billing API. So when two errors occur, it will use a reset period of two seconds to say, okay, if two seconds has passed, you are now allowed to try and reach the billing API again, uh, and this prevents us for retrying or calling the billing API too fast when it's getting overloaded. We can then also say, okay, there's also exponential backlog if this keeps occurring. And we can also see it set a max uh, exponential backoff time. So if the service keeps 
uh, failing and we can never reach the endpoint, then it will eventually have a cooldown period of 60 seconds before it attempts again. So let's take another look here uh, at our uh, billing with circuit breaker composition, because there is a couple of other things that we uh, might want to add. For example, we have here also a retry value. So we also might want to say, we want to recur, we want to schedule that recurs or retries for the amount of retries that we have. And then we can say, repeat this operation. So now this function says, uh, we're going to try to reach the underlying billing API using the original implementation, which was passed from the extension function here. Uh, we are going to protect that call that if it fails too many times according to the circuit breaker strategy, that it will stop reaching the actual billing API. But if it fails, we want to say, okay, we will still want to retry. If we have a single failure, the first failure might be unrelated to the microservices going down. So we might still want to retry it. Uh, additionally, we might also want to say, we want to recur the billing response three times. And we want to do that. while the schedule uh, while the billing response is of type system error. Then we can say repeat this operation until the result sorry it's not uh, yeah while the result is equal to the system error we want to keep repeating uh, this operation. So basically, now we have composed this function to say, uh, I want to repeat this operation until I see a response that is not of the type system error. And in case of in case of a failure, we want to retry. So in the case of a trouble, and we are also protecting our billing service by saying, uh, if too many errors occur while reaching the billing API then you need to make sure that we don't overload the billing API and it will not result in cascading failures. Uh, I saw there were no questions about this. this somebody asked, will the slides be available? Uh, as you can see, uh, we're in the live uh, project. This project will be publicly available uh, after this webinar, so everybody can see and look at the code. Um, and now I'm going to pass the word back uh, to Alejandro, who's going to talk about validation. Yes, actually, if I may add a bit about, about what we've seen here. So something also which is interesting is that, uh, you know, the fact that we can uh, uh, that we can have this thing which which uh, decorates the original thing, it, it's in a, in, a, in a lot depends on the fact that we had uh, the function marker suspend because that means that we have control over when we execute all of this. Uh, the other uh, thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, if, if if you see we we are building uh, Simon was building a kind of complicated uh, uh, way to protect our API. So we're saying uh, try twice if it's not an error, and then otherwise have the circuit breaker. And, and, and this is one of the things we actually wanted to do uh, with Arrow, have all these small composable blocks that you can plug together because, you know, uh, maybe you don't need uh, exactly the same uh, combination uh, that we are showing here, but because all of these blocks are composable, it's just a block which we tries twice and a block which we tries until this happens. And then by using this zip right thing, we can compose both of them, you can actually build your own thing, which, you know, uh, when I was introduced to the effects library, I thought this was kind of a cool thing. Uh, yeah, but as Simon was saying, uh, 
I would like now to show you uh, something uh, which is a bit related, but also uh, a bit different is, is validation. And in this, in this uh, service, uh, as part, well, essentially that what, what we are thinking about the service is that, is that you know, uh, some, some uh, input comes with, uh, it's, it's a service to order stuff. So, you know, essentially like a set of, of product IDs with the amount you want. And then uh, uh, as a first step, we will need to check that all of these elements, uh, all of these IDs are correct, that we have enough amount in the, in the warehouse. Is that what I'm going to focus? And then you can imagine that once we know all of this is good, we will just uh, sum all the all the prices and then it will go to the billing service, which is what Simon was showing. So the billing service will take care of, you know, talking to a Stripe or or whatever other API you use to, to uh, get this billing. So I want to focus now on the part in which we are doing the validation of the warehouse items. And, and, and this looks like a, a simple thing. So essentially we have, uh, one of these interfaces, the warehouse interface is just as a call, which will tell us whether there is enough or this product and whether this product exists. But if you think about how you uh, validate this, this is actually not so easy because, well, uh, all these validations are different calls and, and actually you want to check all of them. And if some of them failed, you want to aggregate these failures. You want to know which have failed. It's not like you want to only check the first one and then fail. You would, in a, in a nice system, you would like to check all of them. And, and also you would like to do it with kind of maximal efficiency. So you don't want to check them in order because maybe you can check them in, in chunks of five. You can make five calls to this warehouse and then you can, well, do it faster. Uh, so this, this actually, uh, by thinking about it, it pointed out that there is one, one, uh, notion which is missing from from the from content to standard library, and this is actually one of the gaps we filled with with the core thing. And I wanna I wanna show you this is called validation. We actually have this nice website, by the way, with a lot of tutorials, and this is part about this error handling tutorial. Uh, so what I was mentioning goes into what we call different validation strategies, what we call uh, failing fast versus accumulating error. So if you think, for example, about how uh, uh, the nullable types work, that's a fail fast uh, validation strategy. At the moment you get a no and you keep doing things with, you know, your, your Elvis uh, dot, uh, sorry, question mark dot operators, then the moment you fail, then you are done, you fail fast, you get the first error. Uh, but in many cases, as, as I was mentioning here, you have a list of different things you wanna check, uh, different projects you wanna check in the warehouse, you want a different strategy, you want to accumulate as many errors as you want, uh, as you can. And for this, we've built uh, the validated uh, data type. So this validated is, it works essentially as, as result, as the result in the, in the standard library, but uh, the crucial difference is when two things, so when you compose two things which fail, you record both failures somehow. Uh, so we have here a big, a big uh, thing. And, and the, main, the main idea here is, is this zip operation. This zip operation this is actually coming from how, uh, you know, the, the name that, that comes from, from like, Haskell and Scala that's essentially saying, well, take two different uh, possible things that fail. In this case, we have uh, an error, which is whether our field contains uh, the, the add symbol and whether it's smaller than 250. These are two different validations that I'm, I'm having here. And uh, if, if they both fail, uh, well, if any of them fails, the result will be a failure. But furthermore, if both fail, we will get uh, the two errors. Or in general, uh, what we want to do here is is uh, is check for every element of the list whether these things uh, any of this is failing. So what we've done is is go one step further even 
and say, okay, we wanna check this, this, uh, this uh, we wanna make this check over each element of the list, but actually this check is not what we would call a pure check. It's not like this where we just wanna check something and we only look at the, at the value itself. We want to, uh, we need to, uh, talk to the database, this, or, or in this case, we talk to the warehouse uh, uh, API. So, Simon, if you could show the warehouse uh, file again. Yeah. So, so this check availability is is uh, the main the main function which will do the check. As, 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 Simon has mentioned we define this an interface so we can later uh, in the test just use some some uh, way to 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 take this and run it in memory. But in the real implementation, we will actually check another microservice uh, in our company. And then we've built this validate availability, which is just kind of a wrapper. Which in the case in which this fails, it will give us an invalid, and you can see it. At the end, so we, we 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 like to use this this kind of uh, kind of way to to write the code in which we say, well, what's the problem? That's from line twenty. I'm talking about. So what the availability problem is is the problem. So you had a problem with this product, and then we call dot invalid uh, nel to create an invalid. So it's it's uh, it's uh, one of the possibilities of this validated type, which is being invalid. And, if you see two lines above, everything goes right. We just wrap the thing on an entry and just call valid because well, everything on well. So if you can go now to the application.kt files, that's that's the main thing. Uh, are we in witness? Just to quickly mention here, sorry. Uh, this NEL here stands for non-empty list, which means if there is any errors in the list, there's always at least one uh, present. So uh, here, the, the main the main part is, well, if you see our process is essentially uh, checking a bunch of things, and, and we have these two blocks that uh, Simon put uh, aside from line 57, which is first, uh, doing the validation of the structure of the of the order that's just pure uh, validation and we are using some some cool techniques to implement this but maybe today there is not enough time what I wanted to uh, here care about is what is happening later in this in this order dot entries dot part traverse validated this is a huge it is a huge name which is doing a lot of things so the validated is telling us that we are doing this kind of validation in which we don't fail fast but accumulate the errors. Then the traverse in front of it is telling us that we are doing this for each element of my list. Uh, and then the par is uh, saying that actually this is going to, if we pass a, a suspend function as, as, uh, as an argument, this will take care of actually uh, doing this, doing these validations in parallel, and will actually take care of the complicated uh, scenarios in which maybe uh, you know you some of these fail, so you want to uh, cancel some of the things which were going on, uh, and so on. So all of this logic is actually done in in one single function. This part traverse validated, and there you can see that the only thing we do is take our warehouse and call. Uh, validate availability. So, you know, so it, I, I like this function because it, it does a lot, but it actually does what you want it to do. Uh, and if there is any error, all of this will just uh, come, and 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 you know, and and this will be the the you know, this will be then actually uh, this will be turned later into this other thing. So. Uh, Talking about about uh, how we do validation, you could see too that 
uh, yeah, and, and Simon knows what I'm going to talk about. Uh, that that uh, we call this, uh, we have this vine thing, and this is uh, also part of something with uh, with well, actually they they built with with Arrow. I wasn't part of this, but it's a cool thing to know about. Is what we call uh, a computation block. So if if you could go a bit up, uh, Simon. Uh, you can see that we have uh, a big thing which says the result is an either thing. And either is the name of the fail fast error type uh, in Arrow. So, so we actually have a different thing because if I remember correctly, result wasn't part of the standard library. I don't know if it's still officially part of the Kotlin standard library. So just in case we have our own version called uh, either, which actually allows you to have anything as as the error type it doesn't have to be an exception type itself and and then in this block what you can do is different computations and when you end them in bind you are essentially saying please at this moment take the result of this and if it if it failed then the whole block is gonna end and it's gonna fail and and you can see that we have three of them so this is the the converse to the to the uh to the validated, this is the, the fail fast part. And we have this nice way to, to write this, which is you can just have this block of one thing after the other and call in bind, just say now uh, take uh, the result, whether it fails or not, and just you know, make this fail fast accumulation. Uh, the, only, the only thing you have to remember, and that's, that's maybe the only uh, complicated thing, is that for all of this to work, you need to choose a common type for errors, and we have defined it here. This this uh, bad request uh, type, uh, which is just what you know accu accumulates. Oh, it's it's actually. Oh right, yeah. So we have the bad request, which is just uh, in this case a simple text content, and and this is the information that we will uh, have if we if we fail. So. So actually, the reason that we're doing this here is basically, for example, if in this first piece of call, you would say, OK, the order that we received was the incorrect payload, uh, then you, you don't want to continue with the rest of the computation because the order that you received here was incorrect. So here we construct a bad request that we want to reply on this incorrect order that we received. And what happens here if we call bind the block here is exit with bad request and now we will come into this block where we say okay we try to receive the order it was an invalid order so the result is either left of bad request and in that case we send the bad request back to the user without executing any of the other code because at this point it's not needed we already know that the result is going to be bad request So uh, again, what what we see here and, and, and our approach with the whole uh, Arrow library is again uh, given a small blocks that you can compose. So so the idea here is is to give you blocks to express. Okay, have this validation. Some of them have have to run one after the other. Some of them have to run in parallel, and and then you can put all of this together. So so I always found that that writing uh, writing validation in this kind of a style is I would say more declarative so you express more your intent more than actually you know having just one one uh thing which just does the validation and returns a boolean saying yes or no uh cool so i don't know if there are any questions actually about yeah. about these two things um well i saw somebody asked a very interesting question about the uh, circuit breaker uh, so maybe if some other questions are still coming in about the validation part, I can already answer that. Uh, some, somebody asked uh, how much work is there in replacing resilience for J uh, with circuit breaker and schedule? That's actually a great question. Uh, so resilience for J uh, out of the box also already has support for suspension. So if you're only using the circuit breaker, uh, then potentially there is not much worth in 
uh, migrating from resilience for j to the circuit breaker for error effects unless you're already using error effects and you want to get rid of the redundant resilience for j uh, dependency since error effects solves the same problem uh, but schedule is actually not the same uh, as resilience for j retries uh, because as we saw in the billing api example uh, the schedule actually does two things it does repetitions and retries uh, so for example here we're saying uh, keep re repeat this function until you see a result that is not of error right and this is something there's a capability that if for as far as i know resilience for j doesn't support it only works on uh, throwables or retrying uh, strategies uh, so schedule in that regard is more powerful uh, than resilience for j so if you're interested in any of this functionality uh, then yeah error effects offers it and as far as i know resilience for j doesn't uh, to quickly answer on somebody else's question somebody also asked um, for example in the case that here the payload would be incorrect uh, or something like that then we know making the call again will probably not result in a successful error because we know for example if it's a 500 uh, then yeah there's probably something else wrong and retrying a 500 might not be worth it so here you could uh, also say just like above uh, zip right and then we can say schedule do while the error that we receive here is not of the type based on what prompt exception for example. And then in this case, if the exception that occurs here is of the type JSON of form exception, then it will actually not retry. All right. So in this case, it will only retry for all exceptions that are not JSON of form exception. So here you can pass in any predicate uh, that you might want to say, okay, for this uh, exceptions, don't actually retry because we know it's fatal. I hope that answers uh, those questions. It's also another question, which I guess is from somebody who has right. seen this kind of bind thing and, you know, uh, know, that actually we've taken this idea for from Scala's for comprehension and 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 this and, and Haskell do notation. It's that's where this is coming from. And, and you know, this, this uh, these two languages have, Similar ideas built in in the language. You can essentially uh, write code which looks imperative, but it's translated into like a sequence of flat maps, one after the other. Uh, so why why not doing something similar here? So one nice thing of of uh, of using just bind as we do here is that is that that means that the whole language is 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 still the same. It, it's not just and a part language as in Haskell or Scala, for example, we are not showing it here, but you could actually, if your uh, if your validation thing would be a number, you could actually say run my first validation dot bind plus run my second validation dot bind, and it will do the right thing. It will like uh, return uh, an error if any of those fails, and otherwise it will return the sum of both of them. And if you compare this uh, with how you need to do it in a Scala or Haskell, you have to introduce an extra variable because you need to write name of your variable, uh, back arrow, uh, whatever. And then you have to introduce these two names only to call at the end X plus Y uh, at the very end. So so this is, I don't know, I've always found this a bit annoying. And, and this way of doing this uh, means that you are explicit in the point where this this uh, kind of effect of failing occurs, but at that point you can uh, you can build the rest of of your code blocks essentially agnostic of this thing. So everything works. You have maybe maybe you know maybe the plus example is just a, a very tiny small example, but imagine where you have binds where things are actually buried one inside the other. You for every a nested call you need you would need to extract this thing and this is you know when you start refactoring all of these things this always gets in the way so that's that's uh you know apart from the fact that you can do it uh, there is a reason why we uh prefer to use this style uh compared compared to the to the other style yeah and actually uh i think 
in general, are you doing this with suspension is more powerful than uh, what people are doing in Esco and Scala, for example, to give you a super small example, we can remove a uh, traverse for either by simply saying, okay, you can actually bind inside the map function uh, of list. Uh, and by doing this, there is no need for a uh, traverse operation because you can just write this in place. And this is allowed because the map function is defined as an inline function. So this bind is still occurring directly inside the DSL. It's not happening inside uh, of another piece of code in a stored Lambda. Uh, and this is something that I've not seen in another language uh, so far. And it's also what gives some of the extreme powers uh, of suspension of these DSLs that we have in Arrow. Well, uh, actually, there is another question, which I think you would be the best uh, to answer yeah. about. So, uh... Yeah, so far, uh, there is no alternative for that feature of resilience for J. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely interested in, uh, you know, talking about it. If there's interest for adding such stuff in a circuit breaker in Arrow, then please open the issue and we can discuss the building this functionality further. But currently, it's not present. I may add, actually, the code for these features is, is not so big. So you may even uh, want to have a look at it and, and, and you know, try to add whatever. We are open for contributions, of course. This is an open Absolutely. source project. Cool. So I think uh, we have time to actually show the cool stuff. Yes. I mean, the cooler so stuff, because all of this is great. Do we do you want to jump back to the browser, or shall I show? Yeah, let's show the Everything meta here. example, and then and then maybe yeah. you can start with the optics part. Yeah. Uh, so you want to go ahead, Andrew? Uh, yeah, sure. So so, you so uh, something here. Yeah. So um, so I was mentioning that one of the things we are we are actually pretty excited about that we are uh, building a few compiler plugins for uh, for the Kotlin compiler, and one of it is is called Arrow Analysis. So, um, so maybe we can just show what it does. If, if uh, we have this wrong piece of code, that's that's line seven and eight, and and maybe if you can if you can run it. So so running it is a bit. It's still we're still figuring this out. So uh, now we have to like run the Gradle task uh, by hand and so on. Uh, but maybe in the meanwhile, you can all think what is wrong in that piece of code. The idea is that this is just. <laughs> Something which which tries to figure out whether there is just one single product, you know, one to, you know, who just buys one thing. We want to sell one more thing. So, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, so it it actually compiler takes its time. As I'm saying, uh, we are running just too many plugins, for example. Uh, yeah, I'm also running too many streaming stuff on my machine. Yeah. <laughs> But you can see that at the end, it, it has a very red message. And it actually points out something at at, uh, at line eight. Uh, and it says, uh, it says uh, the precondition index, and I know what it says later, but maybe, maybe you can make the, 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 the yeah, that. I don't think I can. Oh, oh all right. So, I can. see right. if I can. So it. What? It actually says something on the lines of of uh, the precondition index without bounds is is not is not satisfied here. So what we are actually doing here it's it's uh, running some additional static analysis uh, and and we have a a, a, a precondition that we added. Uh, by using this this uh, plugin called Arrow Analysis, saying, "Well, when you access an element of the list, you'd better access within bounds, because actually this this function it will will just uh, write raise an, an index out of an exception if there is no products, because in that case you cannot access entries of zero. Uh, so this is something that our our uh, plugin can can check for you." And actually, it, it has all the information there. And if you if you uh, could go a bit a bit down, Simon, in, in the right part, if you see 
uh, what it's cool and what we are excited about is that we we were able to to uh, add some some uh, nice data flow analysis to this. So if you have actually checked the right things, so you have checked beforehand, is is my are my entries empty? Then the the problem is gone because this problem may not occur anymore. You have already checked uh, the case where entries is zero and you are doing whatever you want, and then the compiler plugin knows, okay, in the else branch, then it must be the case that entries is not empty. So the access to entries of zero is is uh, is well formed. So yeah, as I said, this, this is the, the uh, kind of thing we're building and, and we are slowly trying to build uh, more and more of this rule. So actually that the, it, this is like more of a, of a generic uh, way to attach loss uh, we call it laws like pre and post conditions to functions that already exist or, or you have written and and then building upon this we we can ensure by running the analysis that everything we've done is right and and you can use this to check out of bound exceptions or to check things and 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 what it's nice it's it's using some underlying reasoning engine uh to do this kind of things like saying okay if it's not empty it means that the size must be greater than zero, so then the check of entries of zero is correct. But you could also replace it with checking, I don't know, that the size is greater than two, and, and all of this reasoning is actually done within the within the plugin. So that's that's one of the plugins we are we are building with this. Uh, it's called the Arrow Meta uh, Library, to which and, and we are trying to complement a bit what the compiler plugin, what the comp Coding compiler already does, uh, you know, doing all this data flow analysis for nulls and this kind of things, which more and more knowledge about about how you do this. Uh, so, Maybe also interesting to mention that uh, now you can here see that this is working already for the Colin standard library. Uh, since we've provided these pre and post conditions for everything in the standard library, but also interesting to know is that Alejandro also built support for the require uh, function, which is in the Kotlin standard library. So any existing library using the Kotlin require or the require not null function, they will now also become uh, compile time checks instead of runtime checks. Uh, I think that is one of the really amazing features. Uh, in this uh, error analysis uh, plugin, uh, compiler plugin, because it will also work on existing code that is already out there, uh, which I think is amazing. And the, the other cool plugin we are building, and, and Simon will tell us a bit, is, is we mentioned a bit about optics, this kind of uh, thing, which is quite nice if you want to uh, work with immutable data in Kotlin. And, and you know we have copy, and copy works for a bit and we actually have an example of you know how it you know stops being so nice uh if you need to go to many nested levels and maybe some of those are actually list and so on so Simon, if you want to talk about it uh before i'm gonna go to optics i see raul has asked an interesting question uh so to fill on what I just mentioned with the required keyword and what Alejandro already mentioned, we can, for example, also define, uh, I'm not sure if this works also for a value class, but we could define a value class called positive int, which is wrapping a primitive value. And here we could now simply say in the init block uh, that the value of the int has to be bigger than zero. Uh, before it to be a positive integer. And since we're using the Kotlin require keyword, which exists in the Kotlin standard library, which error analysis also takes into account, it is now impossible to create this value class with a negative uh, integer. So from here on out, whenever you receive the value of type positive in, you can always be 100% sure that the value inside is actually positive. Uh, and this is so, actually a, co a compile time check, which is like a cool thing. Check, so of yes. course the require, it, it will run at runtime. So uh, you can do it at runtime, but the, the idea here is turns as much of those things we could to the compile time. So, you know, at the end of the day, you don't even have to run the requires because everything has been checked at, at compile time and, you know, any other, you could do it, I think you, you wrote post program with 
but this program would actually not compile. This program will fail with a similar error message as we saw before, but stating that the value should be bigger than zero and it was minus one. Okay, so I'm gonna very briefly show optics uh, and specifically because I want to mention uh, something new uh, and it is a red now, which I really don't like, but let's show it here. So many people, Aero Optics has been a library that's been out there for a very long time. Uh, up till now, it was only supported on the GVM, or at least the DSL functionality was only supported for DSL. Uh, we have now built the KSP uh, compiler plugin, so it will be possible to use Aero Optics with the multi-platform Aero Optics library uh, to generate uh, multi-platform uh, optics uh, with the KSP library. Uh, as we can see here, or actually as we saw in the original examples, we annotate our data classes with the add optics annotation, and we also have to define a companion object, and sadly we still have to manually define it uh, like this, otherwise the compiler cannot find it. But if we have done so, uh, we can now use optics to, for example, rewrite this operation. So in this operation, we want to add one uh, to the amount of every order, uh, of every entry in the order. So we construct a new order uh, and we map all the entries and we say every entry, we're going to take the amount and we're going to increment it with one. Uh, so how can we do this with optics? And I'm not sure why my IntelliJ is here showing red, because I can show you that the code is actually here. Uh, but my IntelliJ can for some reason not find it. But the code is generated and present. Uh, so now we can access it like this and we can say, okay, we are interested in focusing uh, through the optic into the entries property of the order uh, data class, then we want to look into every list item that is inside the entries. And then we say we want to look into the amount uh, that is in the entry. So here we have constructed a value, as it says here, that focuses on every amount that is in every entry inside the order. So to look again at the order data class, the order data class has a list of entries, right? We want to look into every entry and for every entry, we want to look into the amount and we then want to increment the amount by one. So when we have our optic, we can simply say modify using this optic, we're gonna modify this order and we can now just simply say increment the amount with one. And if we do this with the DSL, we can actually, let's see if this works. So it should also be possible to write it like this, which is the DSL functionality of error optics. Uh, and it generates uh, code so that you don't have to work with Compose or you don't have to work like this, but instead you can get a fluid API with auto completion uh, for all the properties that are available in the data class. Uh, it's uh, really too bad <clears throat> that I cannot uh, get my touch to find the KSP code. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, pretty much what I, I had to share uh, today. I didn't see any more questions coming up. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to share, Alejandro? Or... I think you're muted. Alejandro, you're muted. Yeah, so uh, yeah, there was this last question about whether all of this is actually available in IntelliJ. So we try to make Today hasn't worked, but usually with the optics, the inherited code is taken by IntelliJ and you can use it. For the analysis part, we are actually uh, waiting for this new uh, K2 fear uh, 
compiler stuff. So we hope that we can actually share the code. So it seemed to us that that was not so much good, so good to invest into because now we would have to create an, an IntelliJ plugin and a compiler plugin. And, and hopefully in the future, from what we've understood, we can just do it at once. So that's our goal is actually uh, once this new plugin functionality is available to port our analysis there, and hopefully you, we will, you know, you, you'll be able to get the thing both in Gradle and and in the compiler. So, but right now you have to run it manually, and then the error messages appear there, or you can run it through a GitHub action we've done, and then it appears as part of your uh, GitHub review functionality. So, uh, and that I don't know if you can uh, actually. Uh, we can actually see the browser once again, uh, just to you know, uh, you know, uh, tell everybody that that R is there. It's uh, the 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 library itself, uh, the core, the FX, the optics part is is stable. Uh, it's it's version one zero one right now. So you know, go and try it. Uh, and if you think that there is any gap, which is still can be filled and could go well with all this functionality in Arrow. Just feel free to hang out in the in the in the coding slug. We have a, a couple of, of channels about this and or in the GitHub repo and and just you know tell us what you think and what we are missing. Other than that, that was that was everything from our side. That was perfect. Thank you very much. And uh I have one question from my side, kind of philosophical one. Uh, the demo that you have showed uh, to us uh, basically shows building the resilience into the application. So the application itself knows how to behave depending on the configuration you have uh, created, uh, how to handle timeouts, uh, maybe some errors and so on. Uh, but today we have this containerized uh, infrastructure with Kubernetes, with service meshes and so on, where you can also build the resilience uh, kind of in, inside the infrastructure. So what do you think how it all plays well together, like building the resilience into the app and building the resilience in the infrastructure? Well, there is, uh, from my experience, there's always a lot of people in both camps. Uh, but for example, on my current project, uh, my current client project, uh, we're working with a lot of different kind of services and some have to be dealt with a lot more carefully uh, than others. So for some microservices, the need for resilience is much higher and it's much more delicate than for other services. And in that way, they also apply a lot of different strategies depending on what endpoints or what services they're talking to. Uh, and building it into uh, the actual code like this uh, seems for everyone to be a lot more straightforward because actually you can also see everything while you're working on the code. You don't have to go to a Kubernetes configuration to see what the circuit breaker and resilience configuration is for a specific uh, function call that you're trying to make. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. Like the domain knowledge is not always. Uh, on the on the infrastructural side, right? You, you have right. to build it in, in, into the app. All right. Uh, then, uh, well, it was an awesome session. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we can add all the links into the description of the video that will be, you know, on our channel. It's going to be there, so we can just put all the resources into the description. All the folks online, uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, please do. You know, we have more webinars coming up and uh, I'm pretty sure Simon and Alejandro will join us next year for more uh, deep dives into functional programming and, and, and Arrow. Uh, very happy to have you and uh, have a nice evening and thank you for coming, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thanks for watching. Bye -bye.